And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and the sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to me from the other side of the pond, and... And the lead developer of Division 6, Nathaniel Adams. How are you doing today, man? Uh, I'm great. Yeah, with that kind of intro, I feel like I should have a beer here as well. Well, I'm... Well, it's, it's 6 o'clock where you are, so it's not, it's not too early to have a pint. That's true. That's true. I might have to crack one out before we're done. So... With with that said, one of the traditions around here for every newcomer is the origin story, the humble beginnings, in a sense. So with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, wow. Um, okay, I think we're going all the way back into the early 90s, I want to say, probably about 90, 1993. And um, someone introduced me to live-action Vampire the Masquerade. And, you know, I was pretty much hooked from there. And so, unlike most people, I started in live-action and moved to tabletop. And, um, like uh, a little bit of live-action every now and again, you know, I, I'm much, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting on in years, so the ability to just sit around a table and do it is definitely preferable. Um, yeah, so kind of uh, I've always uh, been into that kind of horror thing and so the um, the vampire really appealed to me and I've always liked a little bit of amateur dramatics as well so combining the two together just really set it on fire for me you know mm -hmm. yeah I can get that now with that now with that in mind since you, you mentioned vampire were you somebody who jumped around between a bunch of different systems over the years um, yeah, later on. At first, I was very much in the White Wolf camp. Um, you know, vampire, werewolf, mage, all of that. And that was like my primary gaming. But I did expand out into D&D &D and Call of Cthulhu and, um, you know, a bunch of other things as, as time went on. Um, you know, and eventually Pathfinder as well. And, um, you know, so some, of the, some of the smaller ones, like the more fun games, like... Um, did you, ever, did you ever hear of Toon? That was a that was a fun yeah. one for a while, and yeah, just just some of the uh, little ones that you can have fun one-offs with. So, you know, bouncing around between a number of different systems, definitely. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that, and it's it's the first time in quite a while that I've that I've heard of Toon, and I wasn't the one bringing it up. Uh -uh. Yeah, it's just the one that popped into my mind. I mean, some of the uh, you know crazier ones out there. I think there was. Um, Oh, what was it? Something like Nuns with Guns or something was another one that pops into my mind that I never hear about anymore. Yeah. Now, with Division 6, you're dis you've described yes. this as a as an alt-future fu alt um, setting where magic and psionics are, w are well established. So, mm -hmm. with, that, with that in mind, yep. I'd like to I'd, I'd like to consider what the appendix N of Division 6 was, what sort of media, whether it be other games, whether it be movies, whether it be TV series, uh, served as the major points of inspiration for the idea? Um, well, the uh, the genesis of the whole thing was um, uh, many, many years ago, talking back in like early 2018, um, I was watching a anime that was very much a magical anime. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, a um, uh, a uh, kind of mix between magic and psychic powers, and just kind of the way they did the setting. I thought to myself, "Wow, mixing together both of those is really cool. I like the idea of that." And it just seemed to plant something in my mind that just, you know, wouldn't leave me alone. And it slowly grew and became its own thing. And uh, over time, you know, it just um you know started to get more and more ideas with it and putting it down on paper and you know eventually it became division six and it was 
really nothing like the original inspiration that that put me on the path but at the same time there's still there's still a little bit of uh, that original anime flavor in there but you know i've um brought in lots of other inspiration from like real world myths and legends and um pro probably a whole bunch of movies that i can't even um you know re that i don't even realize i might have been inspired by as well but um, like, like so many things, you, you get a lot of uh, a lot of inspiration without even realising it. But I think at the end of the day, Division Six has very much become its own thing that is very much unlike anything else. Mm -hmm. Now, one the concept of magic and psionics existing in the same universe is something that has been attempted here and there, and it's always been with mixed results. Obviously, one of the big ones that mm -hmm. somebody's going to come up with is the tumultuous history that psionics has in stuff like Dungeons and Dragons over the years. Uh, in your in your opinion, why would you get? Why would you guess it's been it's been difficult for a lot of designers to have magic and psychics coexist? Um, I think it very much depends on the universe. I think with something like Dungeons and Dragons, you're looking at a um, a system and a setting <clears throat> that has very much always been rooted in, you know, magic and the fantastical. And so when you start moving into the the, the, the psychic element, you're kind of starting to touch on the sci-fi there. And I think it's easy enough to create a setting where you've got both of those elements, but when you're coming from a setting that is overly dominated by the magical and always has been starting to weave something new into that can can be potentially diff difficult i think uh -huh. i suppose i suppose as well the the other problem is matt psionics ends up being just magic in a different coat of paint yeah yeah i mean i think at the end of the day their system is very much a um you know it, it, it's a list of spells and a spell book and so when you start bringing in something like psionics which doesn't really you know fit into that box um it's hard to put the two things side by side and and have them work well together mm -hmm. now on the other end on um, a lot of times when it comes to um psionics and sci-fi settings it's treated as a magic system uh in all but name uh, some mm -hmm. cases a bit some cases a bit more literally like say psychers in warhammer Forty Thousand, but with this with this approach you are having magic and psionics in the same in the same universe so what steps did you take to make sure that the two of them are distinct from each other that there's not as much overlap as what's been in the past i think that the um i'd, I'd say two things uh firstly the the magic element very much is um I won't say I won't say a list of spells because you do have the freedom to create your own spells as well. But um, going from the basics of, of it, a sorcerer will, um, in character creation, say um, choose their spells and that's what they can do. Whereas a scion doesn't have like um, you know set spell uh, set spells. They just have abilities that they can do with their psionic powers. And the thing that really sets them apart it's like a um spells are really good at doing very particular things whereas psionic powers have a wide range of possible uses so it's like a that psionic powers are like having an entire toolkit whereas a spell uh, whereas having um magic is like having a selection of very specific highly well crafted tools that can do the that can do very particular jobs better than better than anything else um and so in in that way it's like um let's let's say we take something simple like telekinesis it really is just broad telekinesis in the sense of you can move things around with the power of your mind. It isn't like, oh, here's a spell type ability for how you can use your telekinesis. It, it's just 
the way that you can use them it expands as you become more powerful so you've got a very broad application for your powers when you're a scion compared to the very focused and powerful way that you can apply your magic when you're a sorcerer yeah i can i can certainly get that now fo following on with with that oh. i know with the, with both um with both magic and psionics, it sounds like there's a selection of organizations that you'll be that you'll be associated with. Um, you know, we are, you have the you have the eight scion classes, and you have the ten sorcerer guilds. Um, would those mm -hmm. be would those be a kind of subclass system for scions and sorcerers? Um, it's more that with sorcerers there are. Uh, a number of different guilds and they dictate the style of your magic and the kind of magical philosophy that you have um, for working your spells um, so I don't know let's say for example there's a guild who are called um, the Knights of Avalon and they are very much um, their magic is is very much based around like Arthurian legend and like the magics of Merlin and things like that and the idea is that they're all descended from the Knights of the Round Table and so they use like their swords and knightly duties in order to perform magic spells so it's so the magical guilds in that regard are very much like societies that have their own philosophies and their own ways of teaching magic the scions however with the scion classes are just it's just what you are if if you turn out to be a telekinetic that's what you are you're you're a telekinetic scion so it's almost it's just something that you're born with really um so there isn't like a society of telekinetics or anything like that it's just um that's what you are mm -hmm. and it does it does seem from what from what i saw in the quick start that when picking when picking say a um, psionic class you get a set of tra you get a set of traits for free so is is it a case where after that um development is somewhat free form oh yeah absolutely um the way that i uh have come at it with the psionic powers is that every scion of a certain class has a certain number of free traits that every type of scion of that class has um, so I don't know, just for, for example a hydrokinetic um, is immune to drowning and it also has the ability to sense water like just around them in the atmosphere or underground or whatever where, wherever it might be near um, but after that you can kind of diversify your psionic powers down a um, uh, down like a power tree and so you can choose in which direction you take your character and their powers as you advance your psionic character. Yeah, I I can get that. Now, when it comes to now when it comes to the when it comes to the choice of um, sor of um, sorcerer, is it a, is it a case with them where where their um, choice of advancement is a little bit more focused, a little bit less freeform? Um, no, actually, it's the opposite for um, sorcerers. Um, your choice of advancement for them is even more freeform. So whereas, um, whereas you've got scions who have a very broad power base, and you choose which direction you take them in down their down their power trees, with sorcerers, it's literally okay if you go up to the next um ranking as a sorcerer then you can just choose whatever spells you like at that rank and just start you know advancing your character however you want it's much more of a pick and mix system for the sorcerers so whereas they, they do have those very focused powers but you are completely free in which ones that you choose yeah now since you since you mentioned that spells are a bit specialized is it a case where the where the effects for uh, scions are more about are are ones where you could enhance or or focus them just through just through point allotment or something like that uh yeah very much so i mean when i say it's specific if you think of it this way let's say you've got a um a spell as a sorcerer that allows you to open doors 
that's a very specific spell and you can use it in a lot of different ways but at the end of the day all it can do is open doors if you're a scion let's say you're a uh, again a telekinetic you could use that power to try to um you know rip open a door or um you know try to use your telekinetic powers to pick the inside of the lock or something like that so it's a lot more broad and you can um you know but you have to be very and you can be very creative in how you apply it compared to a sorcerer who will, who will have a very powerful spell with a very specific purpose um so I forgot what your question was. Well, wow, I really got off on one there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, that that well, that would be the main. So, if you're going with the spells, then um, yeah, like I say, specific purpose, but very powerful in doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in that in that regard, it yeah. might be better to look at a spell as like a programming language, yeah, or like, or just like a line of code. Yeah. Like, it yeah definitely that's a good looking at it because at the end of the day the program is going to do that particular program and not and nothing else and if it can't do that thing it's mm -hmm. not going to do anything but yeah yeah that's a good way of looking at it yeah yeah and looking at the way the character sheet is set up you have a setup of spells and rituals of different rank going from one to six um what would the dividing mm -hmm. line between spells and rituals be? Uh, time, basically. Um, with a spell, you're looking at anything that... Uh, a, a magical um, uh, process that will take anywhere from one action to a maximum of uh, three actions. Uh, most of them only... To, like if, depending upon the, the level of the spell. Um, rituals, however, can take hours to perform but they will give you a much bigger and longer lasting effect at the end of it. Mm -hmm. The other thing with rituals is that lots of sorcerers can come together to perform a ritual to, uh, together, and the more sorcerers involved, the more power they're pumping into it, and also the uh, it also reduces the time if you've got more people working on it. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the use of psionics and sorcery, uh, Looking at the sheets, it does look like you have a power ranking setup as well as a uh, pool. So, how, is it mm -hmm. the case where where both of them are using some sort of MP like system, or is or is only one of them doing that? Yeah, we try to make it really easy by having um, magic and psionics functionally the same, so you're not having to learn two different systems. So, you will just roll a d twenty and add your magic dots or you'll roll a d20 and add your psychic power dots. Um, but in addition to that, uh, scions have a psi pool, and sorcerers have a mystic pool. And you can spend a point from those pool, uh, for a point from that pool, to get an extra d6 to add to your roll. And you can spend as many points as you want in one time. So let's say you've got eight points in there and you decide, I'm going to spend them all because I want to get a really amazing magical effect here. So you do your d20 roll, you'd add your um, magic dots to that, and then you'd roll eight d6 on top of it and add it all together to you know basically get your massive magical effect that you're trying for. Yeah. Now, one of the other things that was on the sheet was cyberware. And... Mm -hmm. so and cybernetics has been has been a thing in numerous cyberpunk and adjacent games. Sometimes there's some there's some sort of um, hard upper limit or or the like, or some sort of major cost, like say the essence cost of, cy of cyberware and bioware in Shadowrun, or the empathy cost of, of cyberware in uh, Cyberpunk twenty twenty in Red. We don't talk about V three. <laughs> <But, laughs> Do you, is there something similar to that, or is the cost just a monetary thing when it comes to cybernetics in Division 6? Um, well, you've got your point by to actually buy the cybernetics um, if you're doing it a character creation. Um, if you're doing, if you get cybernetics 
during the course of play, then you basically just have to um, do a dice roll to make sure that they can incorporate into your body well enough that you can control them properly. Um, but that is effectively about it. There's, there's, um, it's not like cybernetics has a negative effect on your magic or your uh, psychic abilities or anything like that. The only thing you do have with them is that every cybernetic implant you have has a running time. Um, and that can be anything from a few hours um, up to a number of weeks before you just have to recharge it. You know, basically plug yourself into the mains and get them recharged. Um, it's the kind of thing that wouldn't come up very often in game, but it's there and it's something for you to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so it, it's more of a, a practical thing, really. Um, there is a slight um addendum to that though in the with scions there is a class of scion called null scions who basically have no abilities except for the fact that they can shut down any supernatural powers including other psionic abilities that are going on around them and that they are completely immune to being targeted by any such abilities now, if they get a cyber, let's say one of them were to get a cybernetic arm, there is a good possibility that doing that um, might mean that their arm is still susceptible because it's technically not a part of their body. But it's the kind again that would be a, a a thing that doesn't come up very often because most null scions give out a field of effect around them, so it wouldn't make much difference. But it's you know a technical a technical thing that could happen the way you describe it it's it sounds like um null, nulls would be akin to blanks or or, or possibly at higher tiers akin to nemesis yeah yes yeah, yeah similarly the the difference of course being blanks just don't just don't exist <laughs> um in the within the mm. warp, they have no they have no signature. They're like a void. Whereas something like a nemesis or a, a pariah um, is is such a negative influence on it that just being around a just them being around a psyker causes them causes them physical pain. Yeah, there's no there's no physical pain being around a null scion or anything like that. Um, it's literally. Um, let, let's say you're a low, like a, a reasonably low level null scion. You basically give out a null field around you, and if anyone who is, um, you know, possessing magic abilities or psionic abilities is standing within that field, then they just can't use their powers. They just they just have zero, um, you know, ability to do so at that point. And even if they are outside of that field, and they try to target you inside the field, they can't. You're completely protected. Of course, the uh, you know the the other side of that though is that as a null scion, that is the only ability you have, so you don't have any actual supernatural powers yourself. But when you start getting into the higher levels of their abilities, they can start to selectively shut down people. So they could you know target a person within their null field and stop their powers from working, whilst at the same time moving their null field away from someone else so that they can use their powers and things like that. Mm -hmm. So with that, in with that in mind, when it comes to the core mechanic, it does look like you're using a D20. Is it a case where the only mm -hmm. die that are going to be used are the D20 and the D6? Yep, 100%. Um, the game runs on just two dice, D20 and D6. Um, I'd say it's good to have a, a nice handful of D6s, but you can totally do it with just one D6 and one D2, D2, uh, one D20. Yeah, if I'm being honest, nobody's going to be doing this with just one D6. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> that's, that's, like, that's like telling somebody that they have enough dice. It's not happening. Yeah, yeah, it's not a real thing. <laughs> you know, it's a, what's, what's next? Somebody's going to tell me that Tottenham Hotspur actually won a game? <laughs> and I know that may sound harsh, but they, but they're the ones who keep chanting, "We, you, you're nothing special. We lose every week." So, <laughs> I mean, I, I will. I mean, I know I'm a Brit, but I'm going to have to take your word for that because I'm not really a football guy. So, I'm. 
I keep an eye on a variety of sports, if, if only for the memes. And <laughs> that. Oh, yeah, you got to appreciate the memes. <laughs> yeah. And every sport has that one team or, indivi or individual that is my whipping boy because they find ways to get in their own way. Um, like, oh, in, yeah, I see. I have one in football and, well, football. Over here in the states, it's the Cowboys because they're fit because their fan base constantly acts like they're God's gift to the sport, and they haven't done anything of note in twenty five years. <laughs> right, in, right. In F one, it's Ferrari because they again act like that, like they are God's gift to, to motor racing, and and they haven't backed it up in quite a while. You might be sensing mm -hmm. a pattern here. Yeah, 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 definitely seeing it. <laughs> but, yeah, but getting back on on that, it's it. I think it was. I think it was an interesting move that you made. That a natural twenty is not an automatic success, but instead grants a exploding D six. Um, what yeah, prompted that's that? Right. What prompted that particular decision? Um. Well. I'd say two things. One, I wanted to make it more interesting. Um, in most cases, if you roll a 20, you're going to succeed anyway. <clears throat> but um, because the uh, the difficulties in the game are set reasonably low, because unlike a lot of games, especially with D20s, um, Division 6 doesn't run on a success-failure mechanic. So it's not like, here's the target difficulty, if you beat it, you succeed. Uh, rather than that, on with, D with Division 6, um, it's based on a level of success. So let's say the difficulty is uh, 12 and you get 13. Then, yeah, you've absolutely succeeded, but only just. But on the other hand, if the difficulty is 12 and you end up getting 24 then that is a massive level of success and it's like not only do you succeed you succeed in the most spectacular way possible so by having the um the mechanic with a natural 20 giving you an exploding d6 um rather than just saying you know automatic success which it probably is anyway um instead you're getting an opportunity to make your amazing success even more spectacular by having an exploding d6 that could just keep pumping you up Mm -hmm. uh, in that regard, I'm reminded of the wild die, which always does something extra if you roll sixes on it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which it's funny that's that's be it's funny that I'm mentioning that, given how the D6 system is making a comeback of sorts lately. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I'm kind of I kind of kick myself because. Um, the game's called Division 6, and the logo is D6 to represent that. And although the D6 die is very prominent in the game, it's, uh, you know, it's still a D20 system. There's part of me that thinks, ah, oh, you know, if only I'd actually, you know, thought this through to the point that I'd made it exclusively a D6 system, and then it, then it um, you know, really would have been all on par with that, that D6 styling. <laughs> yeah. Although... Although doing it as a D six, doing it as a D six system uh, creates its creates its own obstacles. Uh. Yeah, definitely. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I went with um, you know a basic D twenty uh, for the for the majority of the system because everyone it means that anyone can sit down at the table and know immediately the essentials of how they're playing the game. Mm -hmm. Now. With now, with that in mind, when it comes to the when it comes when it comes to that whole degree of success thing, does that also does that also play a role in sit and say combat? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, one one thing that I've uh, that I've done, which you know personally I think is quite interesting, is that I've given. Um, Within the within the core rule, rule yeah, sorry, within the core rule book, um, you've got the basic combat rules, and then at the end of the chapter, you've got some optional rules that you can use to um, basically make changes to your game if if you like, you know, if if you want to try them out. Um, and uh, one of the ones is that in combat you've got the uh, level of success thing and you've got the option within within the rules of saying okay I want to run a 
a basic thing where all the additional levels of success translate over into act, a, into extra damage. And you say, okay, that's that's a nice easy thing to do. Alternatively, you can have all the extra levels of success literally translate over into narrative devices. So you can have a situation where, let's say, you score a high level of success, and after after you know taking a gunshot at somebody, then most instances you'll be like, okay, yeah, you've hit them, and this is the damage that it does. But with this system, if you translate the levels of success into narrative um, as, as well, then it becomes a situation where you hit the person, they take this much damage, and the force of the blast also knocks them over the railing, and they fall three foot to the ground, and they lose their gun as well. Basically reflecting how well you've rolled against them puts them in a worse situation because of what you've done to them. I, I can certainly get that. And it, it did appear that you are using something akin to a wound system. If I've if I've um got if I've got my notes all all situated. Um, so what was that? Akin to a what? In, akin to a wound system where you're checking off where you're checking off wounds after you hit a certain threshold. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but each character has a massive damage threshold where if they take damage um, beyond a certain level, they then roll a d6 to see if they get a, um, you know, a significant wound from it. And if they do get a significant wound, then there's obviously penalties that go along with that and, um, you know, like deductions to their rolls and things like that. And, you know, it could get, you know, getting to the point where you might lose an entire arm or you might, you know, lose a leg or, or a major organ might be, you know, significantly damaged, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I can, I can certainly get, I can certainly get that. Now, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's the kind of thing where um, it's not going to come up all the time in combat, but when someone scores a you know a really big hit on someone, then they get to say, "Oh, I've done a massive amount of damage to the enemy. Oh, and I've also blown their arm off as well, and they're now con continuously bleeding, and they've got all these negative modifiers to their to their um, you know attacks and things like that." Yeah. Now, when it comes to the framing device of Division Six, you have. You have the case where you have sorcerers and scions who are working with this um, organization that seems to be basically a, a supernatural police. Um, and with that, with that in mind, would it be fair of me to say that this is a game that skew that much like say Shadowrun skews a bit towards um, mission-based design when it comes to adventures? I would say, uh, yeah, you could say that to a degree. It's definitely got a police procedural element to it. It is ultimately, at least in terms of the core game, um, it is ultimately a game where you are working for a law enforcement agency and you do have to do things as part of that. However, it's all going to come down to the games, uh, the GM at the end of the day, the Games Master. If they want to run a game that focuses purely on that, then you can do that. But if you want to run a game where there are, you know, lots of other things going on outside of that, um, you know, dipping into the characters' personal lives and their social relationships, you know, and maybe, you know, doing undercover missions and, you know, all sorts of things like that, then you could you could do. Um, it's, it's just like with any game, whatever the GM ends up running is what the game is going to be. It's, it's definitely designed around the idea that you are part of a law enforcement uh, law enforcement agency and that is the primary focus but you can take it in any direction really mm -hmm. oh. the big reason that i want i i brought up the whole mission based thing is i was curious if this is if this is something that would work well with a random mission generator for instance yeah you definitely could yeah oh. all right I, I can get that now since it take since it is taking place in an area that is referred to in the quick start as the city, I am curious if you plan on putting a primer or a gazetteer on the city within the core within the core books. Uh, yeah, within the um, uh, within the, the the Division Six core rulebook, there is a entire chapter about the city. Uh, 
um, it, it works, goes into some of the significant people within the city, um, significant locations, tourist locations, um, all sorts of things. It's, it's a pretty extensive chapter. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the uh, one of the main ideas of the city, and the re the reason why it is just called the city, is because we want it to be your city. So, if you want to have it as a futuristic Los Angeles, then you know the city is Los Angeles. If you want it to be London, then it can be London. Um, on the other hand, if you want to completely create your own place and set it down wherever you want in the world, then you can do that as well. So we we've, we've you know intentionally avoided giving the city any kind of name and only refer to it as the city because we want you to have the freedom to build it yourself and since you're giving that freedom do you plan on having some sort of guidance or setup for gms who want to make their own city and instead of having it be based in like a futuristic variant of an existing one um I'd say that the book already covers that, um, literally in in the um, in the chapter about the city, um, because when it comes down to it, we we've outlined what the city is like, and you can feed into that however you like and add in other um, like landmarks that might be say relative to a place where you live or something if that's what you want to do, but you don't have to do that. So you know you don't have to make it somewhere that is real and, and exists. You can just pip, you can just literally take it straight out of the book and just play it as it is and give it whatever name you want. Um, that's 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 what it comes down to, really. Mm -hmm. I can certainly get that now. As I under, as I understand it, the core book is going to be about four hundred and thirty pages. Uh, are you mm -hmm. with? Is do you think that page count is going to change all that much uh, down down the road, or do you think it's going to be staying consistent at that uh, size? Well, we've got the Kickstarter at the moment, um, and that will be the release of um, the core book at four hundred and was it four hundred and thirty four pages? Wait, no, yeah, yeah, four hundred and thirty four pages, um, and that that's gonna definitely be what it is upon release for future releases like future editions um you know i can't say if there'll be any more um additions to the page count but it's certainly possible but the edition that we're releasing now is is you know it, it's set and it's done and ready i, I can certainly get that so with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a general ballpark. Well, our Kickstarter ends at the end of this month. And then we're going to be in September sending everything out to everyone. Mm -hmm. So that you know technically is the release then that's when people are going to have it in their hands by the end of september and i would then say august um yeah september august um we'll start putting it up online just for general sale mm -hmm. yeah i can i can certainly get that <laughs> and when it comes to the four modules that you set up what do you see the page count of those be or rather, two uh, modules. Each Let me one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, uh, two, two modules. Um, they are both. They're both over. Or they're both about fifty to sixty pages. They're, they, they, um, I can't remember the exact number, but it's around about fifty-five pages. Mm -hmm. All right, I can, I can certainly get that. And I will be looking forward to seeing how Division Six develops down the road. But. Yeah, well, we've got a, a lot of future releases planned within the Division Six universe. Mm -hmm. um, everything from a uh, cryptid codex that's going to cover all of the like monsters and things, supernatural creatures that exist within the world. We're doing a demonology that's going to cover all sorts of um, spirit entities and demons and jinn and things like that. Um, oh, we've got more adventure books on the way as well. Um, just trying to remember everything. One that I'm actually very excited about and very looking forward to is we are doing a fairy book which is set in the division six universe 
but it is a completely standalone game where you will play a member of the Fae within the fairy realm and with a completely you know separate agenda but at the same time it's going to be 100% compatible with Division 6 so you can completely cross them over if you want to I can I can certainly get behind that but with that said I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness here that's oh, you're absolutely welcome. It's uh, it's been a treat. You know, I always like the opportunity to uh, chat away about our creations. <laughs> and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. It's not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Very nice. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!